Hello, my name is Chris Kimball, and I research the Second Seminole War in Florida, but I'd like to talk about somebody tonight whose history in the Seminole War has a direct connection to coastal defense. In fact, something that he tested out and used during the Second Seminole War became part of Army doctrine in coastal defense for the next hundred years afterwards. So, and that is Gabriel James Rains. He tested out in the Second Seminole War what he called the engine of destruction. Gabriel James Rains, uh, born in 1803, died in 1881 at the age of 78. He was in the West Point class of 1827. He was 13th in his class, a very bright student individual, which he will prove later on. He married Mary Jane McClellan, no relation to General George McClellan, but she is the granddaughter of Tennessee Governor John Sevier, who was also governor of the short-lived state of Franklin that became Tennessee. John Sevier was the biggest political rival of Andrew Jackson in, in Tennessee, so he married well. Gabriel Rains and his brother George Washington Rains are known as the Bomb Brothers or the inventors of torpedoes and mines. George Rains, born in 1817, died in 1898. He was in the West Point class of 1842 but he did not stay in the service as long as his older brother and uh, went to pursue the uh, chemistry pursuits and uh, left the army, I think about 1851. And Gabriel Raines also had a son uh, named after his wife's grandfather, Severe, uh, Lieutenant Severe McClellan Raines. Born 1851, died in 1877. I think he graduated from West Point in 1876. He was a well-liked officer, but killed in the Nez Pierce uprising, uh, buried in Fort Walla Walla, Washington Cemetery. It's uh, very unusual to have a Confederate general have his son attend and graduate from West Point shortly after the Civil War. <laughs> Uh, it shows how important uh, Reigns' work during the Civil War was looked upon as technical expertise. So I, I think that's quite something uh, because after the Civil War, there is definitely an anti-Southern bias, but Sever Reigns was uh, very well liked by his compatriots. Gabriel Reigns, the first 12 years of his service was spent mostly out at Fort Gibson and now Oklahoma. You can see a reconstructed Fort Gibson out there. And his wife, Mary, uh, when they were recruiting back east, they're at Newport, Kentucky. He did some uh, recruitment duty around Newport, Kentucky. And she was sick with, I think it was typhoid. He's afraid she is not going to survive, but fortunately she did. And she outlived her husband by two years <laughs> there. So get that out, out of the way while I'm still thinking of it. So most of the duty of Gabriel Reigns was out west before the Civil War. After the Second Seminole War, he went out west again in Oregon, Washington. In February 1839, Gabriel Reigns' company, Company A, 7th Infantry Regiment, went to Florida and they went to Fort McAnope. Here's an image by Tom Brady. We now know by archeological excavation that the fort's not so squared or blocked or traditional, it's actually a trapezoid shape. There are more buildings along the walls, not <laughs> as traditional as we once thought. So Gabriel Reigns is the garrison commander at Fort McAnope. He has several problems while there. At one point, there's a instance where the blacksmith is killed. And at first he 
conduct an investigation. They thought that he had just died from drinking too much. Then they realized he had a blow on the back of his head and $700 was missing from his uh, trunk there. Somebody stole his life savings. Another time there's a soldier that was found out to be a minor, run away from home, ran away uh, from Rochester, New York, found out that Florida wasn't such a great place to be, decided he no longer wanted to be in the army, wrote his father at home. His father wrote the Secretary of War, and Secretary of War, of course, wrote down Florida. Probably took so long, the kid had probably turned 18 by the time they got him out of the army. Fort McAnope uh, was in central Florida. Uh, the 7th Infantry patrolled what's now Alachua County around Gainesville, kind of north central Florida. You'll see in the middle of the screen, there's like an L-shaped lake, that's Orange Lake. Uh, Fort McAnope is a little bit to the, the west of that. So that's the area that the 7th Infantry Regiment's operating from. Fort King I'm going to talk about is about, now it's about 30 minutes drive to the south. Uh, directly south of there. McAnope had the 7th Military District in East Florida. Zachary Taylor was commander of Florida. In 1838, decided to divide it up into 20 mile squares. District 7 East Florida had headquarters Fort McAnope. Fort McAnope's in the center of this map by George Thomas, done in 1839. And directly south of there was Fort King. In January 1840, Reigns and his company went to Fort King, uh, military district one. The districts are numbered east to west. Uh, so even though district one's directly south of district seven. And Fort King was the Seminole Indian Agency before the Second Seminole War. So we're in uh, 1840. Uh, you can see that the fort is in, in the middle where all the roads converge. And south of there is a road famous called the Fort King Road. It goes about 108 miles, I believe, down to Tampa Bay or Fort Brook on the west coast of Florida. Fort King at one time was the Indian Agency. So Gabriel Reigns' company, uh, normally if they had everybody in the company fully manned, it would be about 60 people. And I don't think that it was more than half that at this point. Only He only had about 25, 35 soldiers at the post looking at the post returns. This is Fort King in 1839 by Lieutenant John T. Sprague. Uh, did this sketch of the fort when the uh, commanding general of the army, Alexander Macomb, tried to negotiate with the Seminoles in 1839. So we're about eight months later. And in uh, April 1st, Gabriel Reigns is writing, saying that uh, two of his best soldiers were killed in view of them right in front of the fort. Uh, the company or was going to go pick up a pontoon bridge on the Okawaha River, which the river is that kind of curved and squiggly thing to the right of Fort King. A pontoon boat was, or pontoon bridge was invented four years earlier by Colonel John Lane. And he tragically died in the war at that time too. But the pontoon bridge was very unique and that could all be loaded up in one wagon. So it was easy to transport. So Reigns and his company are leaving the fort and they have two soldiers left behind and some soldiers in the fort. The soldiers, two soldiers left behind outside the fort are tending to the cattle. The command has a large herd of cattle that they're grazing outside the fort. And the Indians attack those two soldiers and kill them right in front of the eyes of Gabriel Reigns and his company. They chase after the Indians, but no avail. So um, 
Reigns is not happy about that. <clears throat> about two weeks later, the Army sets a expedition on April 14th. Um, about 18 soldiers leave the fort and go directly east to the Okawaha River. A hammock area in Florida is an area of hardwoods, very thick, uh, that the Indians are known to hide out and evade the army from. So they find an encampment of Indians in the hammock. Most of them get away. One of the Indians uh, kills one of the soldiers, Private Kelly, but Kelly in his dying act bayonets the Indian and expires two, two hours later from his mortal wounds. Captain Rain says he killed one of my best soldiers. The army finds a woman in the hammock and that's the only prisoner they have. They take her back to Fort King. She says that she has three children, but the army searches and doesn't find them. So they attack the Indian village, which the Indians probably saw no provocation for. Might not have even been the same ones that attacked the two herdsmen. Indians know where the soldiers go. They leave a lot of tracks and footprints and take one of the women in chains back to Fort King. A week later, another army command uh, leaves from Fort King under Lieutenant Scott, joined by another group of soldiers, uh, Lieutenant Hansen from Fort Russell, uh, which is north of Fort King, and also some Dragoon soldiers, making 35 total of the command. And they go south of Fort King to an area that's now in Lake County, Florida, called up Okahumkee Hammock. They find a large Indian encampment. The Indians run off. The woods are very thick. They can't find them. They find a, another woman and capture her, make her prisoner. Uh, they capture 16 Indian horses that are mounted with packs and shot and gunpowder and well armed. They're, the soldiers, chase, most of them chase after the Indians, leave about half a dozen soldiers behind to watch the horses and what they suspected would happen is that the Indians double back and tried to retake the horses, but the soldiers chase them off. And so they go back to Fort King with 16 new horses, another prisoner, and 35 soldiers, you know, uh, one, or, one or two soldiers may have been killed in this skirmish. And the Indians also know where they go. So the Indians are not too happy. So they go back to Fort King. And the sentries at Fort King, while they're doing their guard duty at night, the Seminole shoot a kill two of them. So Captain Marines, he's had enough there of the Indians attacking the fort, even though his command went down and uh, burned the Indian encampment, took the horses, captured a few women. So one of his soldiers that was killed, he takes a bloody shirt and builds what he calls an engine of destruction. About a mile and a half of south of Fort King, uh, Indian trail splits off the Fort King Road. He sets up this engine of destruction, an exploding ch shell with a wire that's the rig to explode when the shirt is pulled off the top. So they leave it there, go out the uh, back to the fort. That evening, they hear the exploding shell. The army rushes out, goes down to that hammock, doesn't find anything, no Indians. Obviously, the shell did its work with the bloody uh, signs that remain. It worked well, but it's turning dark, they can't see, it starts to rain, obliterating any sign they found. So Captain Rain sets up a similar device and goes back to the fort. The next evening, they hear the shell explode again of this explosive device. So this is 20 years or 25 years before uh, Gabriel Rains is uh, experimenting his exploding shells and mines and torpedoes in the Civil War. 
He's first testing them out on the Seminoles. So this is very unique. So the next day on April 28, 1840, Gabriel Rains uh, has a, one of the most significant battles. This is actually the first battle that the regiment is in in 1840 since the uh, War of 1812. Is. In fact, no, the first Seminole War since 1817. So this is 23 years <laughs> without uh, conflict or without being in a battle. So this is a significant battle for the 7th Infantry Regiment. Captain Marine says he takes 16 soldiers with him. It's the only disposable force he has that he can take away from the garrison. The rest uh, needs a at least some soldiers to guard Fort King. Goes a mile and a half south to the hammock where the pond is and the explosive de device was. They're looking around in the woods. Not too different from this, <laughs> looking for the Indians. They have a couple bloodhounds with them. The dogs start to bark. Captain Marine says, what do the dogs see? What are they barking at? One of the soldiers says, oh, they're just barking at rabbits. And, then suddenly they see that they're surrounded by Indians in the woods. And so you have Captain Marines with 16 soldiers. They're surrounded by nearly 100 Indians, uh, gang surrounded. So they have to fight. Uh, they take to the trees, firing, firing away. The Indians try to flank and outflank them. The soldiers get nearly surrounded. And so they do a bayonet charge to charge their way out. They shoot the leader of the Indian force and kill him, and then Indians back away. The company under reins, uh, at the beginning of the battle, the sergeant's killed, bleeding from the mouth, saying, sir, they've killed me, and drops dead, and another soldier dead next to him. As the army's breaking out of the ambush, Cap Marines is shot in the right lung, fought mortally wounded, and so they drag him back to Fort King. Now about uh, you know, four soldiers are killed and about seven or eight are wounded, including Captain Rains. So this is a very significant battle. This is about uh, five or six in number of casualties in the, of uh, all the battles in the Second Seminole War. Very significant. And also that the soldiers survived because they used uh, typical infantry tactics, by the book infantry tactics. Five years earlier, Major Francis Dade was wiped out by the Seminoles, 110 soldiers wiped out about 180 soldiers. Uh, Captain Gabriel Rains had worse odds than that, 17 soldiers against about 100. Two of the soldiers got separated and were hiding in the woods and watching the Indians leaving the scene of the battle afterwards. Said they counted 93 warriors and about 15 or 20 women and four black Seminoles. So that's a pretty significant number. It says this number can be relied upon in the report. Gabriel Rains has thought that he might die from his wounds. He's given a promotion to Brevet Major. Brevet, of course, is a promotion where you get the rank without the pay, and eventually they catch up and give you the pay. His company's pretty much decimated from the battle. They're taken away from Fort King, and the second dragoons take over the garrison at Fort King. Uh, most of the soldiers, uh, they remain in Florida. Captain Rains, he's sent to recuperate in New Orleans at Fort Pike, which I figure they must have been trying to kill him off because if you've ever been to Fort Pike, the mosquitoes are horrendous there. In fact, uh, about 20 years ago, we had a group of Seminole Indians visiting Fort Pike uh, because it's where the Seminoles were in prison for almost up to a year. And so we're we're there at the program that's going on, and they say, oh, it's just like the Everglades with all the mosquitoes there. And Cap Marines kind of 
with the garrison here, but the garrison commander is P.T. Beauregard from New Orleans, who will also be a, a general officer during the Civil War, like Reigns will be. Reigns is here about, uh, about a year recuperating uh, until finally he wants to go back to work, go back to his regiment in Florida. Gets a doctor note, Dr. John Mann said, Major Brevet Gabriel J. Rains of the 7th Regiment of Inter Infantry. Uh, so, you know, the find that the right lobe of his lung has been wounded apparently by a gunshot about a year ago. This is at, uh, on May 1st, 1841, one year after the battle. Uh, says he can't perform any field duty. He's good for light, lighter duty work, maybe with the commissary or quartermaster. And Reigns is e eager to get back to work, but he cannot do that at the time because a yellow fever epidemic shuts down the port at New Orleans. The yellow fever is hitting hard all along the Gulf Coast. In fact, it wipes out one of the port cities in Florida at the time, St. Joseph and also Port Leon, uh, south of Tallahassee. Eventually, Gabriel Rains gets back to Florida, but he's only a few there a few more months until his company is sent, sent out west. Uh, where do they go? Fort Pike, Louisiana, where he just left. And then he's in the Mexican War. And uh, they does some duty out west there. And so April 1861, newspaper in Vermont where Reigns is doing some recruiting duty, says that Reigns is a patriot, even though a southerner says that he will defend the country that he's fought for to the last drop of his blood. Uh, of course, a few weeks later, he changes his mind and joins the Confederacy, where he's uh, wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines. I believe he's also in Shiloh and a few other battles. Uh, so because of his injury, injuries, he's uh, put in charge of conscription for the Confederacy and also in charge of the Torpedo Bureau. So now he gets to work on his passion that he's been working on for years, his explosive devices, that he really starts to perfect them. At first, he, they're used for mines at the uh, Badrock Fred, Fredericksburg, exploding shells. The Union's troops are horrified to be killed and wounded by devices without any Confederate soldiers present. And there's debate among the Confederacy whether to use these explosive devices. But as the war drags on, it's uh, understood that more drastic measures need to be done or the Confederacy will be overwhelmed. And it generally says that he can use his explosive devices in the river protect protecting Richmond uh, so the Union can't take over Richmond and also the defense of the harbors of Charleston, Savannah, and Mobile Bay, and where they are very successful. Down there, it's very famous in the Battle of Mobile Bay. The torpedoes they develops are explosive devices that when they hit the side of the ship, it triggers the device and explodes a keg of gunpowder. Of course, it's watertight. And it's all connected by a chain. So when the ship is crossing the channel and snags the chain, the devices are pulled along the side of the ship and hit the side of the ship and explode. And that's what he has at Mobile Bay. At the Battle of Mobile Bay, Admiral Farragut's fleet has a narrow channel where they can uh, pass through under the guns of Fort Morgan which uh, they're able to do successfully uh, even under heavy fire. It shows that now the brick forts are obsolete because motorized 
uh, ships, uh, ships under power can move past the fort and don't have to be subject to the wind and tacking, uh, adjusting their sails while they're being fired upon. The USS Tecumseh Monitor class ironclad, you see in front on its side, it fears out of the path, out of the safe path that was told to stay in, hits a mine, blows a hole in the side, and it flips over and sinks almost immediately, taking most of the crew with it. It's still down there by Fort Morgan. There's a yellow buoy that marks the spot where it's still now. It's considered a naval graveyard uh, because of the men that went down by the ship with the ship. So it's a very, very important that Gabriel Rains's explosive devices have changed warfare forever and become part of the Army uh, doctrine and fighting, uh, fighting technology after that. So even after the war ends, Gabriel Rains has sought for his technical expertise to continue the torpedoes or mines for the defense of the harbor there. And so he's writing technical manuals even into the 1870s. Uh, so that's probably one reason why his son went to West Point because Gabriel Rains was considered very important to develop this new technology but his health is not well. He's suffering greatly from the wounds they received at Fort King in 1840. In 1876, he's seeking help from uh, General James Hardy in Washington. Says, I'm destitute. Uh, three years, my wound began to trouble me and had an attack in Charleston of neuralgia one of the symptoms. He's asking for General Hardy to contact the Commissioner of Pensions, see what help he can get. Um, so it's, it's very unusual for a Confederate general to ask for a pension from the United States at this point. Pensions were not being given out for soldiers in the Civil War. That would happen a few years later after Reigns' death. Um, but he has the connections, but not without a, a lot of trouble. For example, he sends the paperwork to the government. The government says, we have no record of you ever getting wounded. The uh, stipulation that he's using for getting the pension is the wound that he received in 1840, not as a Confederate general, but as an officer of the US Army. Of course, that the symptoms he gives, the uh, neurologist, it's not something that was created by the wound in his lung, but back then they didn't know anyway. But he actually uh, gets uh, pretty much a, a pension. He's given a job in Charleston for the quartermaster department from 1877 until his death in 1881. So he has a a form of income that way, which is really unprecedented to have a Confederate general getting support from the uh, pensions, uh, commission of pensions from the government. You're very unique uh, before the pensions were really given out. Gabriel Rains, of course, looks very different from this picture at the beginning of the presentation. The time has taken its toll on him. And he dies age 78, August 6, 1881, in Aiken, South Carolina, where he's uh, living on Western South Carolina now, south of uh, Spartanburg, buried at St. Thaddeus Cemetery. His wife, Mary, she dies two years later. They have a family plot in the cemetery that they're buried at. Gabriel Rains is. Uh, technology they developed, it's pretty much remains unchanged. Here's a army manual, uh, late 18th century, I believe, or maybe early 20th century. Not too different from the device that Reigns developed. In fact, becomes part of the coastal defense system. Uh, 
for the next several decades uh, from 1880s up until World War II. So uh, last part of World War II, here's a postcard. Uh, U.S. Coast Artillery, they're pulling up mines <laughs> that are part of the coastal defense. In Fort Morgan, in fact, during the Coastal Artillery and the God era, you have the, uh, there's a casemate where they used to store the mines in the fort. Actually, it's not open to the public uh, because there, there's a big hole they don't want anybody falling into it. In fact, I worked at the fort for two years and I've never been inside <laughs> there. Uh, so it's very unique that the explosive devices that kept Marines tested on the Seminoles became part of the Army uh, Coast Defense, even up to 100 years afterwards. So it's very significant. So I wanted to show you some of the research I had done for Gabriel Rains. You probably know um, about uh, Gabriel Rains from his Civil War history. And I did a, um, all this information I put in a book, a Lachua Ambush, that I wrote. You can get a copy at bookshop.org slash shop slash Seminole War. Also, there's another very good book. Let me show you Gabriel Rains and the Confederate Torpedo Bureau by W. Davis Waters. Uh, maybe some of you have seen that. And that covers the Civil War years. That's a very good book as well. So thank you for your time and enjoy the conference.